Turn with me to Philippians chapter 4, please. Philippians chapter 4 this morning, we'll read verses 4 through 9 together. Apostle Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men, the Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. And the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. We will come back on the 19th and we will finish... Philippians 4, in which we will look at uh, verses 8 and following, two main things we'll look at is dealing with the issue of cultivating an environment of peace in our life. How do we deal with anxiety up front when we're facing it? First thing is we take it to the Lord in prayer, but it's interesting that in verses 8 and following, especially verse 8, he's going to deal with the issue of the things that we're supposed to think upon and dwell on and reflect on. And the very first thing that he is going to begin with is whatever is true. In other words, he's going to deal with true mental health. Because he understands the reality of the fact, as Jonathan Edwards said, that it's the ideas and images in men's minds that are the invisible powers that constantly govern their behavior and their actions in life. In other words, we behave what we believe. And Paul knows that there needs to be an issue of dealing with our minds and what we think on. And the very first one I find very intriguing that he begins with the issue of that which is true. Truth is very vital for us to understand today in society. It's interesting that to, to watch how quickly we have gone down the slide. And I was thinking... Almost 30 years ago, there was a movie that came out about Arnold Schwarzenegger and had Danny DeVito in it, and Arnold Schwarzenegger was pregnant. And the absurdity of that, man, was what made the movie, because it was meant to be a comedy. Like, this is so absurd, this could never happen, this is ridiculous, ha ha ha. But look at where we are today. If you say that a man cannot get pregnant and cannot breastfeed, then you are a transphobic, right, bigot who does not belong in the public square and ought to be banished from society. 30 years. Not that long. The truth is vital. And thinking upon what is true is vital for us as believers and especially when we're dealing with the issue of anxiety in our life and the fears that we may have when we watch the things that are going on us around the world. We are talking about the shalom of God or Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. And this is the twofold thought that we have and it runs through this even though the words are not mentioned all the way through here. But it is the peace of God from the God of peace. It is what He provides for us. And I find it interesting that He is the God of peace. But does he need peace in his life? Is there disturbance with God? There's absolute serenity with God, simplicity with God. But all the things that make for peace, does he is the God of peace? Because he can provide that for us. There's no one who can take all the pieces and put them together and make us whole. There's no one who can do that in society. There's no movement. There's no political party. There is no thing that we can vote in that's going to make us and fix us and take away all of our fears and anxieties. The only one who can make us whole is God Himself. Thus, He is the God of peace. He is the God of completeness. 
Thus he who began a good work in you will finish it. Because he always finishes what he starts. Unlike us. <laughs> it's a lot of projects I've started in my lifetime and I haven't finished them all. And there's a lot I'm not going to finish. I remember growing up in a house I lived in for 13 years of my life and I learned how to do construction living in that house with my dad. We added on rooms, the garage, the den, all of these things we did. I learned how to wire and do insulation and drywall and everything else I learned at the feet of my father. But we had rooms in that house that you were always looking at drywall. And the only time they got finished is when we were going to sell the house and move to another house. But God always finishes what He starts. He never leaves anything undone. And when we come to the issue of anxiety in our life and worry, there are several passages for me that have always been a refreshment to my soul. The first one is in Mark 4.39, and it, speaking of Jesus, says that He rebuked the wind, and He said unto the sea, Peace, and be still, and the wind ceased, and there was great calm, or as the NASB renders it, it became perfectly calm. And I always have to ask myself, cannot Jehovah Shalom, can He still not do that in my life? With my restless heart and thoughts that pass through my mind at night, when the winds of fear and anxiety and distress and affliction come upon me, can He not still that storm? Does He not have the ability to do that? And the answer is He is more than able to do that. But sometimes we forget in the midst of this, and this is why these passages are so crucial to me, because it's preparing my mind ahead of time, right? Cultivating that atmosphere and environment of peace and, and, and freedom of, from anxiety and fear. And I do this by reflecting on that which is true about who He is. Another passage that's so important to me in my life is Psalm 93. It says this, The waves roar, O Yahweh. The waves roar and the waves roar and crash. Above the sound of the surging water and the mighty waves of the sea, Yahweh sits enthroned in majesty. And I'm always reminded of this passage of the effortless sovereignty of God. While everything rages around us, He sits calmly in control. I have nothing to fear because He's on the throne. Thus, my always, I should always go to Him because He is the one who can still the storm. Not only the one that's outside of my life, but the one that's inside of my life, right? In my heart and mind. Or Isaiah 26.3 Reminds me of my necessity to keep my mind on Him. Isaiah writes this, Whose mind is stayed on you, speaking of Yahweh, you will keep Him in perfect peace, because in you He trusts. It's an interesting thing because in Hebrew, literally, it is shalom, shalom, and they do this to show intensity and perfection. So we translate it perfect peace. But He is the God who will keep you in shalom, shalom. Complete and perfect peace. As long as my mind is stayed on Him. True mental health. We have the answer for that, brothers and sisters, and it's found in the Word of God. We saw the reality of the Lord's return in verses 17 through 21 of chapter 3, the relationship with the Lord in union with Him, 4 1 through 9, peace in our personal relationships, 4 1 through 3, dealing with relationships within the church and our peace and our relationships that extend beyond that because He's going to give a broader scope in verse 5. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men, not just to the brethren and to those who are in the church, but also to everyone out there in the world, the enemies of the cross of Christ. Peace that we should have in our relationship with them, but it's all contingent on us. We can't do anything about them, but we can do something about us. The first thing he begins with is the fact that we need to rejoice in the Lord and it needs to be unchanging joy. In other words, always be full of joy in the Lord. There's always something to rejoice about and we realize that our circumstances alone do not determine the condition of our heart and mind. They can influence us, but the question is how do I respond to them, right? Because I can't control everything that goes on in the world around me, but I control what happens inside of me and how I respond to that. And it isn't unreasonable for Paul to exhort us to rejoice in the Lord because this disposition of joy is something that should be cultivated in our life and we should grow in. And we will find as we walk with Christ that there are more and more reasons to rejoice but at least begin with the fact that He is worth magnifying in our life. Everything for Paul was about magnifying Christ. 
He found reasons to rejoice, and the ultimate reason was Christ. All the way through Philippians, we find this going back to chapter 1 and on. He always found that this was his primary reason for rejoicing was the fact that he, he gloried in the fact of his cross and in his crown and his coming again. And he rejoiced in that and he gloried in that. And therefore, whatever came in his life, he could rejoice in the Lord because it was all for Christ. If anything, it's for him. If anything, the things that we go through are opportunities for us to magnify Christ before the world. It's an opportunity for us to glorify Him. That enough is, is enough for, for rejoicing in our life. That He is glorified in whatever we go through. Whether it's imprisonment, whether it's wrongly accused of something, whether it's the suffering at the hands of those who are to be believers and brethren who are supposed to love us and yet they don't always do that. The center of his life of rejoicing was Christ. Rejoice in the Lord, he says. And again I say, rejoice. Not only that, but we are supposed to be gentle. We are to show sweet reasonableness to everybody. And there is this element of contentment with and generosity towards other people in our life. Big heartedness is another word that is used to describe this particular word in Greek. And we saw last week that not one word is sufficient to cover what this word means. But there is so much involved in this and a lot of it is about laying aside our own rights. Which takes us back to chapter 2 and dealing with our relationship not only with those within the body but in the world. As he gives us the example of Christ. Do nothing, chapter 2 verse 3. Do nothing from selfishness and empty conceit but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not look out for your own personal interests, but for the interests of others. Literal rendering. Thus we should show mercy and leniency toward the faults and failures of others. It's interesting how we look at our life and we think, man, I'm so understanding for so-and-so because they're so hard to get along with. But we fail sometimes to recognize the fact that people take some work to get along with us. We all have failures. We all have weaknesses. We all have faults. We all have idiosyncrasies that other people have to put up with and deal with. And this should be our relationship to everybody, not just those within the confines of the church. Thus we should show patience without retaliation in the midst of injustice and maltreatment from others. This is the example that the Apostle Paul showed us. You see, if we have a rejoicing heart and a heart that's focused on the Lord, we can be serving of others, no matter what happens to us. We look for opportunities to glorify Him to them. It's interesting because when I think about this word that he uses here, sweet reasonableness, you know, if I'm, if I'm practicing this in my life and I'm really being selfless, then I'm not going to be grumbling and complaining and disputing with others. Isn't that what happens when I grumble and complain? It's because life isn't going the way I want it to. Things aren't fitting my schedule. <laughs> So he wants us to get our eyes on God and our eyes on other people and our eyes off of us. And the encouragement that he gives us is the fact that the Lord is near, verse 5. And it's interesting about this phrase. that it, It's put most translations at the end of verse 5, but it can go with the beginning of verse 6. In other words, it provides a nice transition and really can get motivation for both of them. It can be the motive for our forbearance with others because he is going to come again. His return is imminent and therefore judgment is going to come and he's always going to put everything right. Vindication will come with the Lord. So I don't need to worry always about what's going to happen to me and, and if people take advantage of me for the sake of the kingdom so be it God will always right those wrongs and the Lord is going to return soon and therefore when he returns all of these things are going to be righted but it's also motivation for my restful spirit because why get anxious over the things of this world because it's all temporary in other words worry is a species of myopia nearsightedness I get so caught up in the things that are going around me in the right here the right now that I forget that there's a then Right? We heard the passage read this morning about the food and the clothing and 
All of these things that are about the now. Seek ye first His kingdom and His righteousness, right? Get your perspective where it needs to be. Not on this world, but out of this world. i got to be so heavenly minded that I can be earthly good. The problem is that I am so earthly minded, I am no heavenly good. And worry shows that. When I become anxious over things in this life, it shows where my perspective is and where my heart is and where my treasure is. Because wherever my treasure is, there is my heart. So he deals with peace in our heart, verses 6 through 7, and anxiety and worry is issued then of heart and mind. It's not biological, it's not a chemical problem. And this is what he comes to in verse 7. He says, The peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This is the issue. It's a spiritual issue. And when we deal with anxiety and worry and depression, we need to define those things by Scripture, not by world. Psychology is right out, and I can't harmonize that with the Word of God. That's syncretism. I believe that the Word of God is sufficient for all things in this life, no matter what we face. And if anyone comes to me for counseling, that is the only place that I will go. Because it's the only place that has the answers. And we can look at the world and see this, and this is how they see it. They see that anxiety and fear is merely just a chemical reaction to the things around us. So what's the answer? Pop a pill and that will fix it. That doesn't fix anything. That's just whitewashing tombs. What is needed is regeneration and renewing of the heart and mind. Or as Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 4, to renew the spirit of the mind, the highest principle that governs the mind. We're talking about deep spiritual realities. This is not a chemical imbalance that needs to be fixed with a pill. It needs to be fixed with the truth. And the world needs to hear the truth, and so do we. And I need to cultivate my mind by the truth. Because all around me is absurdity. The things that we find being said by those who are quote-unquote well-educated and have the highest degrees and now they're sitting in the highest court of the land and they can't even tell you what a female is. That's absurd. But this is where we go when we turn away from God and His revelation. This is why the Word of God is given to us. Because it contains the truth. So how we define these things is important. And definitions come and go, but the question is, are they biblical? One thought is, worry over tomorrow pulls shadows over today's sunshine. And there's ways that we can describe these things, worry and anxiety. Worry is like a rocking chair. It will give you something to do, but it won't get you anywhere. And that's the truth. But is this biblical? And I actually know someone, this is how they deal with fear and anxiety in their life. They sit in a rocking chair and they rock till the feeling passes. But here's the problem, they never fix the problem. Oswald Chambers gets a little bit closer to it. Worry is an indication that we think God cannot look after us. It's an issue of trust. Look at Luke chapter 12. It's amazing all the statements that are made there in regards to worry and anxiety in our life. And there's one recurring thought that comes back over and over and over again. The lack of trust in God. Worry is putting question marks where God has put periods. (laughs) I do not play the what if game. If you want to play that game, don't come to me. I don't play that game. I don't do what ifs. I don't try to speculate. Because all that does is lead our minds down a trail of not reality and truth, but what ifs, right? What if this and what if that and all of these things that we can conjure up in our mind that aren't even true or real that we even know can even happen and we assume that might happen, but we're not omniscient, so we don't really know. 
And before you know it, with all of these what ifs, all of a sudden now we feel ourselves down in the bottom of this well and we can barely see any sunlight up at the top. And we wonder, how did we get here? Because we let our minds go to places that are not true. We start throwing up question marks everywhere. Isn't this what Satan did to Eve? Question the goodness of God? Worry is an intrusion into God's providence. Amen to that. Worry is practical atheism and an affront to God. Now we're getting closer. Now we're getting closer. Because really when it comes down to it, I'm calling God into question. I impugn the character of God whenever I worry and fear about things in life. So how do I respond to this? Paul says in verse 6, we want to pray for everything. Pray for everything, pray with thanksgiving, and pray with expectation. There's an old hymn that goes like this, Thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring, for his grace and power are such that none can ever ask too much. Do you believe that with God? Do you believe that you can come and ask Him anything? I, I was struck by this when we were looking for a new car. We needed a new car, 15 passenger. I, my wife and I, we weren't quite thinking about stopping on having kids at the time, so I'm thinking I got to get ready. And two of the things that, that struck me in the process of doing this was one that I just didn't think that this was worthy to take to God, that he didn't love me enough that he would worry about these kind of small things in my life, right, and be concerned about them. And the other was that I saw that it was such a huge thing because I'm thinking, how in the world can I afford a car? It's just no way. But I, we need this. And in my mind, I'm building this thing up to be so big that there's no way that God can fulfill this. And yet he showed me that he can do above and beyond that we all could ever ask or think possible. And I realized that my God was too small because it was a God of my mind, not a God of truth. And there's nothing too big for him. So prayer is always seasonable, it's always needful, and it's always profitable. Corey Timboom was a godly sage, several wise thoughts that she had regarding anxiety and worry, but bringing things to the Lord in prayer. She says, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? God has used her in a mighty way in my life. She also said that any concern too small to be turned into a prayer is too small to be made into a burden. This was a woman who was steeped in the Word of God, but the realization that there is nothing too great for His power, but there's nothing too small for His love to be concerned about. It's amazing to me that all the little things that God does in our life, the personal things, the things that others wouldn't even know about us, or that concern us, or that are important to us, and that He would respond and He would meet these needs and do these things in our life is such a reminder of His love for us. To the very minute details of our life, to the things so personal that even those closest to us don't even know. And yet He will always be there. Thus take it to the Lord in prayer. Why do we hang on to these things and allow them to fester? As to Peter put it this way, transfer responsibility, cast all your cares upon God. So many things that we take into our mind and heart and we fester on them, we think on them, and, and they overcome us and they're pulling our minds in all different directions. We take on things that belong solely to God and we try to take these things on as our responsibilities when they're His. So I remember one lady saying to her friend, she says, I figured out the victory over anxiety. So her friend says, okay, so what's that? And she says, I learned a lesson a long time ago. I entered into a partnership. And she said, a partnership? What do you mean by that? And she says, I entered into a partnership with the Lord. I said to the Lord, I'll do the work. You do all the worrying. And she says, I haven't worried since. Most oftentimes when we find ourselves anxious and worrying over something and fearful over something is that it's something that belongs to God, not to us. 
We want to fix it. We want to answer it. God says, give it to me, it's mine. (laughs) But all our burdens, all the things that we become anxious over, and it can be anything. This is why we pray about everything, because we never know what's going to lead someone down this pathway. It's funny to me how often, like, I see something major happen in someone's life, and I'm thinking, okay, this is, they're going to come unglued over this, right? This is a major issue. And then you look at them, and they respond like, ah, no big deal. Spilt milk, right? Is what you're thinking, this is not the kind of response that, that should be warranted to this issue, right? But then you see them actually like spilt milk and they're like unglued and you're going, what in the world is going on here? This is nothing. And you have made it everything. Dads, we're good at this with our kids. <laughs> So then just take everything. Don't hang on to anything. (laughs) He says these requests, you need to take them to God. And literally, he says, take them into his presence. Pros, face to face with God. In other words, recount them before him. In other words, this isn't talking about making God aware of something. This is about taking things and releasing them to his care. This is why he uses a phrasing here that's not used elsewhere. Normally, with this word for asking, it's used with a dative case in Greek. In other words, it's more about just giving information. That's not what we do with God. We're not informing of something that he doesn't already know. He knows what our needs are. What Paul is saying is here, we need to bring these things into his presence, lay them down and leave them there and walk away. All those troubles that plague our minds and hearts, then we cease to have them hidden and bottled up within us because we do that. I do that. (laughs) I internalize everything. And I don't like to talk about it. It's just not me. Don't want to burden anyone else with it. As far as I'm concerned, every burden is for me to bear. I have a really hard time sharing. But we need to. We need to let go of these things and give them to God. Because they'll eat us alive. They will. So we find vital lessons about prayer here. Prayer isn't merely talking at God, but coming to God with confidence and dependence and trust. Prayer isn't merely about communication to or informing of, uh, but it was a communion with God. Or as Vine puts it very eloquently, he says, although God knows all our needs before we ask Him, He delights to have that expression of our confidence in Him, which intelligently utters our needs in detail in communion with Him. It's what prayer is. It's communion with God. It's coming in before Him and laying these things down and leaving them in His hands to deal with. Hezekiah. Very few examples that are good come from Hezekiah, but Hezekiah. Upon receiving a potentially anxiety-producing letter about the Assyrians and the fact that they want to destroy the nation of Israel, this is his response to it. He took the letter from the hand of the messengers and he read it. And he went up to the house of the Lord and he spread it, notice, out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and he said, O Lord, the God of Israel, who art enthroned above the cherubim, thou art the God, thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. In other words, I am coming to the one supreme being who is not merely just some abstract force out there, but a supreme being who hears and knows and understands and wants to respond. And he cares about all the things that are in my life and even those enemies that want to destroy me and I can come and I can lay them before him and I can leave them there because he cares isn't that what Peter says cast all your cares on him because he cares for you he loves you more than anyone can ever love you it's so hard for me to fathom Not only are we to pray for everything, but we need to be thankful for anything. <laughs> you catch that wording? Thankful for anything. 
See, Paul doesn't talk about how the prayers are answered. He doesn't tell us that we get what we want. He doesn't tell us that God answers us according to what we want Him to answer. He doesn't say that. Just take it to the Lord, leave it with the Lord, and be thankful for anything. Whatever comes. Paul's sitting in prison. He'd already been in prison for two years in Caesarea. Now he's in Rome, potentially losing his life. You know, Peter, you sent an angel and you delivered him. <laughs> I'm still here, waiting. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for anything. Because whatever it is, it's the Lord's answer to me. It's His will. Whether He gives me what I want or not. Yes? If He sits on the throne, then however He answers my prayer, that's His answer to me. Or as Fee puts it in regards to Romans chapter 1, verse 21, lack of gratitude is the first step towards idolatry. It's the first thing that they're condemned for, right? That they suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. And what do they not do? They do not glorify God and they don't thank Him. <laughs> they're ungrateful. They don't realize that they have life because of me. And they take that life and they squander it in sin and everything else. So spiritually stable believers then react to trials with thankful prayer. This Paul helps us to understand. Every single one of his letters pretty much begins with an outpouring of gratitude to God. Just go through his letters. They all begin this way. Even Corinth, which is always astounding to me, with all of the sin that's in that church, he still stops and thanks God for them and the grace in their life. Not only that, but when you read his letters all the way through his letters, over and over, it's about our lives being marked by gratitude to God. This is what he calls us to. So someone has well said that prayer without thanksgiving is like a bird without wings. Your prayers don't soar. Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 and 17, that thanksgiving is to accompany all activities. Whatever we do, whatever we say. Or how about in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything, in everything, I hate that everything, everything and always, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. You want to know God's will for your life? This is it. He wills that you be thankful in everything. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20, always give thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God the Father. Always for all things. So with love then that is to mark the life of the believer is thanksgiving. We should be the most thankful people on the planet. But where do we hear most of the grumbling and complaining from? We have the most selfless example, and yet all our bickering and infighting is driven by selfishness and self-centeredness. As gratitude is a basic and lasting element of the Christian life. And as Paul says in 2 Corinthians twice, he helps us to understand that as gratitude abounds, God is glorified. Whenever we give thanks, we're praising God and glorifying God for this. It's about honoring and adoring Him. And what's interesting about the statement here in Philippians, as he adds this statement of thanksgiving on to the, the, the request and supplication, is that with thanksgiving, he doesn't use the article, and I'm not going to get into all the details of it, but we find it with both the prayer and the supplication. So he specifies both of those. What's the point of this? Grammatically speaking in the Greek, as I see this, this is what Paul is saying. It isn't merely just about the act, it's about the attitude. He talks about the act of the prayer and the supplication. These are things that you do. Bring these things to the Lord but here he's talking about the attitude that lies behind it. In other words, not only are we supposed to have a spirit of gratitude, we're also supposed to have a spirit of submission. 
Notice how thanksgiving comes after the requests have been made. It doesn't say that they've been answered. I take them there, I leave them there, and I thank God. And whether you're bringing needs or whether it's just mere adoration, whatever it is, you're always thanking Him. In other words, thanksgiving should go with everything. Those moments of adoration should be bathed with praise and thanksgiving. The moments of bringing our needs and leaving them before the Lord should be bathed with thanksgiving and praise. It should mark everything about us. In other words, this attitude of gratitude and submission excludes anxiety because we realize that it's the will of God. It is the sum of everything for us. This is what we desire, that God's will be done. This is how we should pray. Not my will, but thy will be done. And we thank Him. Why? Because His will is going to be done, regardless of whatever the answer is. Thank Him for anything. So prayerful for everything, but thankful for anything. If we want to catch a little ditty to it, stick it in our minds. Pray with expectation, verse 7. And we end with this. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard our hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is the outgrowth. Literally, I would translate it this way. And so the peace, right? This is the blessed result of leaving everything in the hands of God by means of prayer and gratitude based on an unwavering confidence that God is able and willing to do that which is ultimately best for us in our life. The peace will come. Peace will come. Irene, which comes from a road, is the joining or binding together what is broken or divided when we are worrying and anxious over things. Our minds are divided in all different directions upon what is true and not true and expectations and all of this stuff and the what ifs and all of these things that are going on in our head. All of these ends, they will be brought and they will be made one again. This is what God does. He fixes us because <laughs> we're all broken. He gives us peace. And if I can give a sort of rather contemporary thought to this, it's like as having it all together. People will look at our life and they're going to look at the things going on in our life and they're going, this should be unraveling you and yet you have got it all together. Why? Because I have the peace of God. He is what is garrisoned around my heart and mind. He has put everything together. Everything in its place. This is what the world needs to see from us. Because everything is out of place out there. They need peace with God and they need the peace of God. But the peace with God first, they need to be redeemed. God's peace will then powerfully be at work in our lives as a result of pouring out our hearts to Him. Instead of hearts that are captured by worry and anxiety, they will be guarded by God's peace. So the antidote then to anxiety is the peace of God. It's that which guards us and it's that which guides us, verse 9. It's that operative force in our life. We need it. This isn't the peace of God. This is not an objective genitive. This is not peace with God. This is already understood and assumed by Paul as he talks about this. This is subjective genitive. This is that peace that comes from God. And it is that peace that's operative in our life. It's like a guard standing around and garrisoning our heart and mind under the sovereign influence of the Lord. And these two words together, heart and mind, cardia, and noemata, it deals with all that is within us, the entire inner being, our emotions, our affections, our thoughts, moral choices, everything is garrisoned by the peace of God. Our hearts and minds are vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy, not because the enemy can get within us, but he can plant ideas, wrong ideas, lies, not the truth, Right? can infiltrate our minds with these things and this is what drives us right the ideas and images of our minds are the invisible powers that determine our conduct and life 
And what we feed our mind is everything. And this is one of the things that the peace of God will help protect, is help protect our minds. And not only that, but this peace being from God and in Christ, Paul says, it surpasses all comprehension. This is that word who pairs, super, super duper. This is so amazing that you can't even comprehend it's so amazing. In other words, God's peace continually stands beyond superior to and transcends all human intellect, analysis, and insight. People are going to look at your life and see what's going on in your life, and they're going to look at you and go, how in the world are you responding the way you're responding? This doesn't make sense to me. You should be doing this or that or the other thing, not what you were doing. There's complete quietness about you. There is a calmness to your life. There is this sense of tranquility. In the midst of all of this turmoil, what is it that's going on in your life? It's the peace of God. This phrase is reminiscent of Paul's words in Ephesians when he talks about being beyond all that we can ask or think. That's in dealing with the power of God, chapter 3, verse 20. If you look at the same chapter in Ephesians 3, 17, he's going to talk about the same thing in reference to the love of God, right? That means that everything about God is understandable but incomprehensible. His love is incomprehensible. His power is incomprehensible. His peace is incomprehensible. We can't comprehend it fully. Peace of God which he shares with his children is often incomprehensible as in the case of Paul and Silas when they're sitting in prison in Philippi and they're in stocks and yet they're worshiping God. How do you do this? And then comes an earthquake. (laughs) Christians have often been seen to show peaceful calmness, a sense of utter tranquility, in spite of being persecuted, suffering, facing death, completely baffling to all human reason. That is the peace of God. And we can have that, brothers and sisters, in our life. We can have that. More and more and more of that. Amen? Let's pray. Our gracious Father, We so humbly come before your throne of grace and we glory and rejoice in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And in the blessings that we have as a result of our union with Him. Not only the position that we have before you that we are justified and sanctified and we stand in a state of peace before you, that there's reconciliation that we have in Him, but that we can experience the reality of these things on an ongoing basis in our life in Him. We praise You and thank You for this precious gift that You have given us in Your Son. I ask, Father, that we be found faithful this next week as we share this gift to others. that we go about our days magnifying Christ, no matter what's going on around us, that we seek His glory, His honor, His exaltation in everything that we face. May He receive the glory and the attention that is due Him. We thank You for the presence of Your Spirit. We thank You for Your truth. It shapes our minds and hearts and guides us and guards us and protects us. And all we ask, Father, is that as we walk as strangers in this land, that you do not take your word from us. For we need it so badly. Praise you and thank you, Father, for your watchful care over all your people, whether it's through flooding or anything else. We know that you love them more than anyone else could ever love them. And that you care about the smallest things of their life. That you have the hairs on their head numbered. 
but we ask that you will have your will in them. And that they experience the reality of your presence with them in greater ways today. Pray these things in your name. Amen.